Father, we thank you for your blessings and for your grace and for your peace this day. How about I pray for your wisdom, Father? I pray for your just for your clearness of thought in my mind, Father, for me to be able to articulate my thoughts today. I just ask you, Father, for me to rely upon you, to lean upon you, and for those to hear that, Father, they would consider according to your word, and that you would be glorified in all of it, that your word would be upheld and sustained, glorified, represented properly and clearly, and truthfully. And Father, we know that this is all by your Holy Spirit, Father. We thank you for your goodness, and we pray for your grace. In Yeshua's name, amen. Okay, we are going to continue looking in the book of Acts. Last time we looked in chapter 9 at the conversion of the Apostle Paul, which took place about 35 AD, so about five years after our Lord's ascension. And our focus, however, then was on a man that was part of Paul's conversion experience. Of course, the man I'm referring to is Ananias. We saw that even five years after Christ's ascension, Ananias, being a believer, being a disciple of the Lord, he was still continuing keeping God's commandments devoutly. So we're going to move on from there. And for the next uh, couple of weeks, I want to move on to an event that happened about 42 AD. So we're going to jump about seven years into the future from chapter 9 to chapter 10. Twelve years after our Lord's ascension. To an event that many use today to say that God's dietary laws were abolished. The event I'm referring to is the misunderstood meaning of Peter's vision. But before we get to Peter's vision, I think it best to spend this week looking at the circumstances that led to uh, Peter's famous vision. We'll look at Peter's vision next week, the details of that. But in order to understand the meaning of Peter's vision, that is to understand what God was really saying to Peter, we must understand why Peter had the vision. And to do that, we must look at the circumstances that led to that vision. The circumstances I'm referring to involves a man named Cornelius. Turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 10, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Acts chapter 10, and beginning at verse 1, reads, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms liberally to the people, and prayed constantly to God. About the ninth hour of the day he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He will tell you what you must do. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and coming near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Continue with me, please, in verse 21 of Acts chapter 10. And Peter went down to the men and said, 
I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. What does the Bible here tell us about this one named Cornelius? First, we're told that Cornelius is a Roman centurion. Now, we know by this that he is not a blood descendant of Abraham. We know that he is not Jewish, that he is a Gentile. We're also told that he is a devout man. Now, this is the same word devout that we looked at last time about the man named Ananias. It said that he was devout according to the law. It means that he was a strict observer of the law. It states here that Cornelius was a devout man who feared God. Now, this particular description is probably not talking about somebody who feared God or had respect for God. I'm sure Cornelius feared God and did have respect for him. But David Stern translates this as a God-fearer, that Cornelius was a God-fearer. David Stern wrote the Jewish New Testament, and in his commentary, he explains about what a God-fearer is. It's not just someone who fears God, although they fear God, but that a God-fearer is a Gentile at a certain level in the conversion process to being a full-fledged proselyte, or what we would call formal Jude Jewish conversion. That Cornelius was not just a Gentile, that he was a Gentile who had already begun the process of a conversion to Judaism, to where when a Gentile would go through this process, at the end of this process, he's no longer considered a Gentile by the Jewish people. He's considered a Jewish person as if he was born Jewish. So Cornelius, according to David Stern here, Cornelius was a person who was in this process of converting to Judaism. He just not, he had not at this point gone to that full-fledged conversion of baptism and all, and all the ceremonies of making him a, a full proselyte. He was what's called a proselyte at the gate. Nevertheless, a person in this position a god fear would have been keeping the Sabbath. He would have been keeping the dietary laws and the feast days. And he would have been attending synagogue. He would have been attending synagogue worship. And, it's, and the scripture here says that along with his, all of his household, his family, and his servants. It says that he gave alms liberally that he was a generous, generous person who helped the poor. And we can, we can take from this that that at least includes some of the Jewish people around him. It says that he prayed continually to God. Now, he was a Roman centurion, and usually this would mean that there was worship of many gods. But Cornelius worshipped God and prayed to the one true God. And then the final thing that, we're said, that is said about him is that he was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. Wow. <laughs> this is quite a list, really. Cornelius was not, the tip, was not a typical Gentile. He was not a typical Roman centurion. He had the favor of the whole Jewish nation. In other words, Cornelius loved God, and he loved God's people. And he was walking faithfully in the understanding that he had. But these good deeds, these good works, 
that we just looked at could not take away his sins. They could not make him right with God. Twelve years earlier, God had revealed the path to himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And through his death and sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Cornelius was not aware of this. Cornelius' understanding of what God was expecting of him was shaped by the Jewish leaders of his day, by their instructions for him in his process to full Judaism. But justification and salvation cannot be found in being devout, even devout according to the law. It could not be found in helping the poor. Nor could it be found in praying to God continually. And not by having the favor of the whole Jewish nation. None of these can take away sins. Now even though doing these things in of themselves cannot take away sins, they cannot save a person, Cornelius was doing them to honor and to please God. In other words, his heart was right. This really is none other than a soul searching to know his maker, to please his maker. And all these things that Cornelius was doing proved that his desire was to honor God and to serve him faithfully. And because of this, God received Cornelius' prayers and his helping of the poor, it says, as a memorial. It's not just that he, that he, that he heard it, he just happened to catch it in his ear. That Cornelius' prayer and his alms ascended to God as a memorial. So God sent an angel to Cornelius to talk to Cornelius. The angel, however, did not tell Cornelius how to be saved. Why? Because God gave the ministry of reconciliation to people. That's why. God gave the message of salvation through the mouths of people. You and me. But it's not the job of the angels on high to come down and preach the saving gospel message of Jesus Christ to a dying world. That job He gave to us. That job He put into the hands of those He first reconciled and then made ministers of reconciliation. People. The angel said, Send for Peter, and he will tell you what you must do. This is why Peter had his vision. So that he would go and talk to Cornelius. Or Peter would not have done so. We'll look at that a little bit more into that next week. You see, the authority and the authenticity of the promise of eternal life that a Gentile may expect for being a God-fearer is only an imaginary substitute created by the unbelieving rabbis of his day. There is no biblical precedence for it. In other words, being a God-fearer as Cornelius was, being as religious as he was, does not save anyone. Salvation has always been by faith. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and beginning at verse 4 reads, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he received approval 
as righteous. God bearing witness by accepting his gifts. He died, but through his faith, he is still speaking. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was attested as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Turn back with me. Well, first of all, I just wanted to share that I want to share something with you today that I would like you to consider. You know, there may be all kinds of different thoughts and attitudes concerning this subject that I'm about to talk about. And sometimes they stir up all kinds of emotions and responses in us. But I just want to ask you to hear me out. I think it's possible that we might be missing something, something extremely important that I want to cover today that stems from this man Cornelius and from Peter. And yet we see it throughout the scriptures. And it's just something that I want you to consider. Turn with me back, turn with me again, please, back to Acts chapter 10. And we've already established here that Cornelius was seeking God. The scripture says here in Acts 10, verse 3, that an angel came to Cornelius at about the ninth hour. Why the ninth hour? Which, by the way, corresponds at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for our time. The ninth hour. Why did the angel come in the ninth hour? Well, I think that the answer is found in Acts 10, verse 30. In the King James, it says it this way, And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. That was the angel. It says that he was praying in the ninth hour. The angel came to him in the ninth hour because Cornelius was praying. Okay, so Cornelius was praying. Was it a coincidence that it was the ninth hour? The Revised Standard Version translated, translate, translates it a little bit clearer. About this hour, I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer in my house. About this hour, I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer in my house. Okay, so what is this ninth hour of prayer that he's referring to here? What is Peter talking about? I mean, what is the scripture here talking about? And what about the passage that we read about Peter in verse 9? Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Again, why the sixth hour? What does the Bible, why does the Bible note the times of these prayers and when they took place? Well, I submit to you that it's because they're not random times. These passages are probably referring to the three scheduled prayer times that we find in the Bible. Could it be that these are the scheduled prayers recorded in the Bible that took place in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. Now, the morning and the evening times of these prayers, we know that they paralleled with the daily sacrifices. Turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 29.
And beginning at verse 38, it reads, now these here are the instructions for the daily sacrifices. And beginning in verse 38 of Exodus 29, it reads, Now this is what you shall offer upon the altar, two lambs a year old, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer in the evening. And then there was also incense that they were to burn. And in chapter 30 of Exodus, and beginning at verse 7, it reads, And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it, speaking on the altar. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps in the evening, he shall burn it as a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So we here have the two descriptions of these offerings that were given in the morning and in the evening. Now these scheduled prayer times, the morning one and the evening one, are scheduled at these times. Now it's not clear about the noon prayer, but we do see it in scriptures. According to the Strong's Concordance, and according to Jewish history, the morning, which is sometimes referred to in Scripture as the third hour, correlates for us to be nine o'clock in the morning. The noon, or sometimes referred to in your Scripture as the sixth hour, is at noon, twelve o'clock. And the evening, sometimes referred to in Scripture as the ninth hour, is three o'clock in the afternoon. Is it these three prayer times that are being observed and acknowledged throughout Scripture? We're going to look at some examples in Scripture in both the Old and New Testament when people were praying or going to prayer at these hours. Now, usually, when someone talks about these, this subject of these three prayer hours, these three traditional prayer times, they include what the people were praying. Well, right now, I just want to go over with you and keep the focus on the times of the prayers. Okay, does everyone understand? Not the kinds of prayers, but the times of the prayers. Okay? Let's take a look at events that happened in these three specific hours in a chronological order. So we're going to go through we're going to go through some scripture passages in a chronological order looking at some events that happened in these three times of prayer, specifically these three different hours. Except for one, there will be one that will be out of chronological order and I'll tell you that when I get to it. But turn with me please to 1 Kings chapter 18. While you're turning there I'll just fill you in a little bit. This here is the story of Elijah and his battle with the prophets of Baal. This, is in, this takes place in the days of Ahab and Jezebel, and Israel has turned to much idolatry, and basically it all has come to a head. This closing out these three and a half years of famine, and Elijah calls Ahab and says, look, gather the people, gather the 450 prophets of Baal, and we're going to have a showdown. He said, Gather the people together. And when Elijah gathered the people together, he said to them, How long, how long are you going to, to waver who is God? Is Baal God or is Yahweh God? Let's settle this today. Let's settle this right now. And he told the 450 prophets of Baal, he said, Look, you offer a sacrifice and then you call upon Baal and see if he answers. I'll do the same, and I'll call upon Yahweh, the true God, and see if he answers. And the one that answers, that's the true God. And everybody agreed. All the, all the Israel that gathered around agreed. Well, the prophets of Baal, it says that they made their morning offering, and that they cried and they gashed themselves all the way up until noon. But Baal never answered. And Elijah says, well, cry a little louder. Put yourselves into this a little bit more. Maybe he's on a trip. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. 
Maybe you just need to continue to cry out to him. So it says that they cried out even louder and louder. But there was no answer. And then Elijah took over the situation. And he put the offering on the altar. And then it says, and you all are probably familiar with the story, he doused it with lots and lots of water. And then he called on God. And in 1 Kings 18, verse 36, it says, And at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at, as, at thy word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that thou, O Lord, art God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and it consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. It says here that Elijah offered up this prayer at the time of the evening sacrifice, which is considered the ninth hour, three o'clock, and fire fell. Turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 6. Okay, now what is going on here is Daniel is in Babylon. This is after the Babylonian uh, captivity. But Persia has taken over. And there is a king named Darius here. And he had some scoundrels that didn't like Daniel. And these guys came before the king and they said, Hey, king, why don't you make an edict that says for a certain period of time, no one can pray to you any God except for you. Now they did this because they were trying to find a way to find an accusation against Daniel and they could not because he was so, uh, yeah, so upright. So they, did, they got the king to sign this order, this edict. And it was upon this signing that we hear these words in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. And when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. And he got down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So it says here that Daniel prayed three times a day. This was his custom. Now, obviously, this isn't saying that he was keeping the, these at these three specific hours. Is there other, any other information on Daniel's prayer life? There is. Turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 9. Now, in this, the little bit of background behind this verse, this is Daniel. And, and the angel Gabriel comes to him and gives him the whole prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Well, what was going on when this took place? In Daniel 9.21, it reads, While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of of the evening sacrifice. Again, this is about three o'clock in the afternoon. This is the ninth hour of the day, the evening sacrifice. Now turn with me, please, to Luke chapter one.
Okay, this here is talking about the story of Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. He was a priest, and he was serving in the temple. And while he was in the temple, he saw an angel while he was offering the sacrifice of the incense. And he sees an angel that tells him he's going to have a son named John. Okay, so in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 9, it says, According to the custom of the priesthood, it fell to him, Zechariah, by lot, to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and that there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. It says here that this was the hour of incense. Now, it's true here that we do not know which hour it is. We don't know that if it's the morning offering or if it's the evening offering, but we know that it's one or the other and that the people were praying at this hour. Turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 15. It should be just two pages back. This is Mark's account of the events regarding our Messiah's passion or his suffering. Notice the times recorded for these details and ask yourself, are they a coincidence? Mark 15, verse 25, tells us, And it was the third hour when they crucified him. Now the third hour is nine o'clock in the morning. Mark 15, 33, reveals to us, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land. The sixth hour is noon, and it brought darkness. Mark 15, verse 34, just that first, that first opening statement, then we'll move down to 37. Mark 15, 34, and at, not, and at the ninth hour, Continue with me in verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. So at the ninth hour, that is at three o'clock, our Lord died on the cross. Now that may not be a big uh, mystery revealed to you that those traditional times are thrown out. Scholars throw those time out all the time. That our Lord was crucified at 9 a.m. in the morning. Darkness fell upon the earth at noon and at 3 o'clock he died. Two of those are in direct reference to the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. But why is the noon recorded here? Why is the darkness over the earth at noon recorded? Could it be that while the people were praying, seeking God in the second hour of the scheduled prayers, that God's answer to all prayer was being rejected. So darkness fell on that hour of prayer. Nevertheless, whether that's true or not, the details are mentioned in these specific prayer times. Turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 2. Now, this is when the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come. But what time was it when Pentecost had fully come? And that the Holy Spirit fell on the believers that day. Well, we get in some insight to this when we look at verse 15 of Acts chapter 2. This is Peter. He stands up before the crowd that has gathered around and are amazed because they don't know exactly what's happening here. Some say these men are drunk. 
And then these words are recorded in response. Acts 2, 15. This is Peter speaking. Peter speaking. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Again, this is the time of the morning sacrifice. It's the time of the morning scheduled prayer time. When the Holy Spirit came, 9 a.m. Now, what were the apostles doing before the Holy Spirit fell that day? Praying. Acts 1.14 tells us they, that they devoted themselves to prayer from the time the Lord ascended to the 10 days later when we come to Shavuot or Pentecost. Now please turn to Acts chapter 3. This is the story of Peter and John going to the temple. Why are they going to the temple? Acts chapter 3 verse 1 tells us, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So this is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They were on their way at the time of the evening prayer time. It's also the time when the cripple is healed at their hands. Okay, I want to make a chronological exception here. Scripturally, we don't know when these three prayer times that were scheduled started, and we don't know how far back they really go. We know that, as from the scriptures I just went over them with you, with, you with, that they existed. But when they got started and how far back exactly they go, we don't know. But I believe it's what King David is referring to when he writes the 55th Psalm. It says David says in the 55th Psalm, in the 17th verse, Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. All right, now with all these scriptures laid out before us, we arrive back at our story today. Please turn back to Acts chapter 10. In verse 3, it says that Cornelius was keeping the ninth hour of prayer. Verse 30 tells us that he was. We already looked at that. Acts chapter 10, verse 3 says, About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. It's the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. An angel comes to Cornelius, gives him, gives him instructions to go and find Peter, that he might come back and tell Cornelius what he must do. Now, still being in the book of Acts, please move down to the ninth verse. This reveals us here that Peter is about to have a vision. We'll talk about more of this next time, but I do want to just read this verse. The next day, as they were on their journey and coming near the city, Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Six hours at noon, Peter has a vision. Still in Acts, chapter 10, take a look at verse 30. This is when Cornelius gets saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, verse 30 says, And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright apparel. About the ninth, uh, excuse me, about this hour, Cornelius 
says, I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer in my house. Cornelius is revealing here to Peter that had come to Cornelius' house that about the ninth hour, about this same time of the day, I had a vision of an angel who told me to send for you. So what is this relaying to us? This is relaying to us that they're back again at the ninth hour. Because Cornelius says, about this time, I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer four days ago when an angel came and said, send for you, and now you have now come. And Peter arrives at the ninth hour. And what happened? Cornelius and his house were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Gentiles' inclusion begins. Turn back with me, please, to Acts chapter 2. And verse 42. Now this passage here is describing the new believers being added to the faith. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. The prayers. Could the prayers refer to, in Acts 2.42, being refer could it be referring to the three separate times of prayer? See, if it is referring to the three separate hours of prayer, that does not mean that it was the traditional rabbinic prayers that they were praying. Typically, when Messianics talk about these hours of prayer, they want to include the idea that traditional prayers were being used. And maybe some people did use them. Which prayers existed at that time? We're not real sure. But just keep in mind that when the disciples of our Lord came to Him and asked Him how to pray in Luke chapter 11, just how He responded. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Now this is the disciples of the Lord and they come to the Lord, and they ask Him this question. Because John's disciples had asked John this very question that they're about to ask Him. Here's His response. Luke chapter 11 in verse 1 reads, And He was praying, He here is Jesus, He was praying in a certain place, and when He ceased, one of His disciples said to Him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say. And it goes on here to be what we call the Lord's Prayer. Notice here that Jesus does not say to his disciples, What do you mean, teach us to pray? What do you mean, what to pray? What, what are you saying? Notice, this, notice that our Lord does not say, well, what are you talking about? Pray the traditional prayers that they pray in the synagogues. What, do you, what are you asking me how to pray? He doesn't point them to the traditional rabbinic prayers that were going on in the synagogues and at the temple sites. He tells them to say, our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, we can say that this is just a an overlap of all prayers that can be prayed, and it is that. 
But he said, say this. It's those words that were being spoken. It's what we call the Our Father prayer or the Lord's Prayer. John must not have given traditional prayers to his disciples either. It's not to speak down on the traditional rabbinic prayers and so forth. It's just to note that that's not where our Lord sent his disciples. Now, before I go on, we need to realize that these three hours of prayer that I've been talking about are not commanded by God. And I'm not saying that they were in any way. They were not something that were even that was I would say was even expected of somebody. But I would say this, they were surely a custom of the Bible. They were a custom that we see in the Bible. And there were benefits. I believe there were great benefits. You see, all the examples that we looked at of people actually being in the hour of prayer, and there are no other, there are none that I left out that I'm, that I'm aware of. Every, every situation that we looked at when a person was in one of these designated hours of prayer, a supernatural event took place. Fire fell for Elijah in the ninth hour. Gabriel came to Daniel in the ninth hour. Gabriel came to Zechariah in the third hour. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost in the third hour. The cripple was healed in the ninth hour. The angel came to Cornelius in the ninth hour. Peter had his vision in the sixth hour. Cornelius and his house was filled with the Holy Spirit in the ninth hour. And by faith, David believed that God would answer him as he prayed morning, evening, and at noon. Now you may be thinking, Art, are you implying that if we pray during these three separate hours of prayer that we'll see angels? Or that we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit? Or that cripples will be healed? Well, <laughs> not necessarily. But isn't that up to God? I mean, do we really believe that can happen today? <clears throat> can we believe the scripture when it says that he rewards those who seek him? Because if we don't believe that, we can't please him. Because that's what faith is. Believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. There are other benefits. For one, it's good discipline. And someone may say, well, you know what, Art? I've got a job. I mean, I'm not sure what you're saying here. I'm not sure what you're asking. I'm not able to keep these situations, they're not commanded. If you're not able to do it, you're not able to do it. But there are benefits to it. But even if you do have a job, okay, but keep in mind, the hour of prayer doesn't have to take an hour. It's just that time frame by which these prayers took place. There are Jewish people today who still keep these three times of prayer and they may, they may be only in there for a few minutes. It's, 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 what they had, it's what they had at that given point in time to be able to offer. Maybe you can only stop for a minute. There's no time frame on how long or how short it really has to be. And it's not stringent on the minute of when it starts. You know, in Acts 
10, verse 3, and verse 9, and verse 30, they all say about. Do you realize that? About the ninth hour, about the sixth hour, about this hour. And there's no given directions exactly where it needs to take place. It could be at home for Cornelius. It was at home. It could be at work. It could be in your car. You say, well, how, how can you do it in your car? Well, keep your eyes open when you're driving. But you can offer up that prayer to God. You don't have to have your eyes closed. But, it, but I would probably recommend that you would pull over and offer up a few minutes of prayer. It can be done. Maybe it has to be on your break at work. Maybe it won't be exactly at 9 o'clock, noon, or 3. Maybe it won't be until quarter after. Okay, I understand the topic of scheduled prayer. It might make some people a little uncomfortable, and that's fine. Again, it's not a rule. But for those who want to join some of us, we're going to try to observe them. I want to encourage you with a few things. I want to encourage you to try to pray at the beginning of these hours of prayer. Even if you don't keep the whole hour. But sometime within the hour. Within the time frame, say we're speaking about the 9 o'clock hour of prayer, sometime in that hour from 9 to 10 o'clock. And, and if we miss it, we miss it. Just go wait till the noon one. But if you can spend some time in that time period, I would encourage you to do it. Here's what's kind of happening in my heart about this whole subject here, as I've been looking at this for the last two weeks. Preparing what to share. I really believe that the enemy doesn't want us to be united as a congregation. And I really believe that the Lord, or that the evil one does not want the Messianic movement to be united as a movement. And when I think about the whole thing that took place of uniting these two camps that we read about in Ezekiel chapter 37, you know, the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim coming together, and the whole idea of the Gentiles being brought into this camp. When I look about how that all took place in Scripture, the big inclusion begins with the story we're looking at with, with Cornelius. And what was, what was it that sprung this forward? It was prayer. Because really, without prayer, we're not, we're not going to do anything. No, nothing of any eternal significance takes place without prayer. We, we see the example of our Lord in prayer all the time. And I think, was it a coincidence that Cornelius was in the ninth hour of prayer when he gets a vision that would, that would ultimately bring him into the fold, would ultimately change the dynamics of the establishment of the kingdom of God and the restoration as we know it. And it was Peter in the sixth hour of prayer that gets this vision that prepares his heart to go see this man whom he would not go see otherwise. And then arrives back at his house at the ninth hour. Gives the salvation message, and the Holy Spirit falls upon this family, and they're brought and established as part of the kingdom of God. Was it a coincidence? Are we missing something here? Are we missing something in this cycle here? If there's nothing to what I'm saying, what's praying scheduled three times a day going to hurt? It's not going to hurt anything. Would everybody agree with that? Not going to hurt anything. And I'm not into I'm not into uh, you know uh, 
lucky rabbit's foot type theologies. I'm not saying this opens the door to some, some lost thing that's just, I'm not saying that either. But I'm saying this, it is a pattern that we see in the scripture. And every single example that the scripture gives for a person abiding by this prayer cycle has a supernatural event take place. Now, does it mean that every time somebody does this, a supernatural event takes place? No. But it must fertile the ground somehow for God to decide to move and to do something. And I know that sometimes in us, emotions are building us. I don't know what to do. Art, you're talking, this is really strange. Um, I, I don't know where you're going here. I don't know what you're trying to say because, you know, schedule, it's too liturgical. There's, call it what you want. If you're uncomfortable, don't do it. But if I've grabbed your attention th through the scripture, go back and look at them yourselves, please. I'll give you the references. Go back and look at them yourselves and then ask God, God, are you trying to say something to your people at large about, about a path that you yourself may choose to, to take? That's all, that's all I'm asking. That's all I want to put before you. If you are interested in doing this, I'd like to try to kind of unite us as a congregation on this level. Pray in the morning. You say, all right, I get up at 6 o'clock before the kids are awake and before my day gets started, and I pray. Don't stop doing that. Please keep doing that. All right, I go to sleep at night right before bed because I believe that when I pray before sleep, I'm able to sleep. The enemy is cast out and... He doesn't have any power over me in my sleep. Keep doing it. Please keep doing it. Don't, I don't want to hinder any of that. What I'm asking you to do is maybe to kind of bring us together in our prayer times. You know, you guys gave me a list of names to bring before the Lord. Names of people that you want to see come to the Lord for salvation. People, then, you gave, then I asked you for a list of names of people that are already saved that you want God to show the message of, uh, of a better understanding of his word with regard to his commandments. Do you guys remember that? I pray for these people every single day. There's only uh, there's a, maybe a handful of, of times where I, I, miss, I blew it. I missed out. Now more than five. I do. I pray for them every single day. Are you still praying for them? Ten minutes. That was the covenant we made with each other. Ten minutes a day that you would lift these names up before the Lord. And I'm doing it. I'm asking you to do this. In one of these three hours of prayer, in one of these three scheduled times of prayer, lift those names up before the Lord. Okay? If it takes the three cycles to, come to do the ten minutes, that's fine. But use that time and let us, let us start unifying on this level. We want to reach people with the message of Jesus Christ, do we not? We want, to, we want to also reach our brothers and sisters already in the faith with a message of God's commandments, with, with the validity of His commandments in our lives. We're not going to have any success without prayer. It's just the way it is. It's how God works. So if you're going to, incl if you're going to include this, my family and I, I want to do this. I, I, I want to seek God. I, I, I want to do what He says. Look for Him. Ask. Knock. He says the door will open. If you're going to, please keep it in within these time frames in addition to your other prayers so that there's some unity. Okay? In that. Nine, noon, and three. Also, I'm going to ask you if you do this, if it's possible, if it's not, that's fine. To pray facing east or pray facing Jerusalem. For us, that's east. Do it when, when you do it, pray facing east. And you think, well, that's, uh, I, wouldn't, I realize we do that here, but uh, it's kind of strange. Well, we have an example of it in the prophet Daniel. It said that he went. And he opened his windows toward Jerusalem. 
He directed his prayer toward Jerusalem. For that, for us, that's east. East. But Daniel was probably doing that because of the instructions that he got from Solomon. See, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he said, Lord, if thy people are ever cast away to a foreign land, and if they will turn and they will pray toward this house, Solomon asked the Lord that if he would hear their prayer, that if he would honor their prayer, and the Lord told Solomon he would. Solomon also, for our benefit, Solomon also prayed and said, and for the foreigner, the Gentile, he said, Lord, if they will turn thy face toward this city and seek thee and pray, will you answer them? You know what the Lord said? He said he would. He promised Solomon that if a Gentile prayed toward that city and was seeking God, that God would answer their prayer. The position that we pray in is unimportant. We see people on their knees in Scripture. We see people prostrate. We see people standing. And what to pray. I'm going to give you the instructions that the Bible gives. I'm not going to tell you to pray the traditional rabbinic prayers because the Bible doesn't tell you to do it. I would instruct you, and again, it doesn't say we have to, but I would instruct you to speak the words that our Master gave us as disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. And then if you desire, your own personal prayers. Okay, uh, I'm just asking you to consider the things I've said today. Think on them. Pray on them, and just uh, ask the Lord what he would have you to do in this. Uh, thank you for your time. Next week, we'll get on to Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10. A couple of weeks ago, I asked you to read chapter 10 to please be uh, uh, at least familiar with it. So if you have forgot to do that, you got this week to do that. Please read chapter 10. We'll go over it next week. Thank you for your time.